Tonight, Donald Trump is found liable for sexual abuse. We're very happy. What the verdict means for the former U.S. president and his bid to return to the White House. As wildfires tear through Alberta, the anxious wait for tens of thousands who just want to go back home. I can't sleep well at night knowing that what's lurking out there could turn on us. And why so many stars want to own the sets. This franchise is going to have a very bright future. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Years after the accusations first surfaced, tonight a verdict for Donald Trump. A jury says the former U.S. president did sexually abuse former magazine writer E. Jean Carroll. This is not a criminal trial, it's a civil case. Trump has been found liable for the abuse and defamation. And for that, the jury says Trump must pay Carroll millions of dollars in damages. Reaction to the verdict has been swift, some of it coming from the man who never set foot in the courtroom. Chris Reyes takes us through it all. Roberta, can we please have a statement? Holding hands to the very end, and as E. Jean Carroll did throughout the trial, she let her lead counsel do the talking. We're very happy. From Carroll, no words, only a smile, and then later, a statement. I filed this lawsuit against Donald Trump to clear my name and get my life back, she said. Today, the world finally knows the truth. This victory is not just for me, but for every woman who has suffered because she was not believed. Trump was nowhere near the courthouse when the verdict came out, but fired back on social media, calling the trial unfair. I have absolutely no idea who this woman is, Trump wrote, calling the verdict a disgrace. Trump's lawyer had a different word. Strange verdict. Um, this was a rape claim. It was a rape case all along, and the jury rejected that, but made all the findings, so... Um, will obviously be appealing those other findings. It took the jury of six men and three women less than three hours to reach a verdict. The Trump sexually abused Carol in a luxury department store in the mid-90s. But the jury said Carol did not prove that Trump raped her. On defamation, the jury ruled that Trump made a false and malicious statement when he called Carol a liar after she went public with her story in 2019. He's repeatedly called her story a hoax. Outside the courthouse, cheers of support for Carol. You are so brave and beautiful. Thank you. To see this man who is really the epitome of power and, uh, frankly, entitlement, to see that man held to account is, is something that I think um, it, it, many people didn't expect to happen. And I think that for survivors watching, it is meaningful. I think for anyone who cares about accountability, uh, this is momentous. Trump is being ordered to pay Carol over $5 million U.S. in damages. From Trump's team, this is the takeaway. It was strange. Uh, part of me was obviously very happy that Donald Trump was not branded a rapist. So, Chris, all of this is happening as Trump pushes ahead with his bid for the White House. That's right. I mean, this certainly doesn't disqualify him from running for office. And, of course, last month, Trump was formally charged in a criminal case here in New York. That hasn't affected him in the polls. He is still the leading Republican candidate for president. Now that he's been found liable of this sexual abuse and defamation, will it affect him? Hard to tell, but there's every indication that he'll be using this in his campaigning. He has repeatedly called this lawsuit politically motivated. Now, tomorrow, Trump takes part in a televised town hall, so we'll have to wait to see how he handles this verdict on a big stage. All right, Chris Reyes in New York. Thank you, Chris. Another prominent Republican appears to be in legal trouble tonight. According to multiple reports, George Santos is facing criminal charges. Santos has made headlines on numerous occasions for a string of lies that have been unearthed since he was elected to Congress. He's also under investigation by the House Ethics Committee. So far, it is not clear what Santos is being charged with, but reports say he's expected to turn himself in tomorrow. Turning now to the wildfire crisis in Alberta, where damper weather has helped slow the advance in some areas, but not everywhere. Officials say the situation remains serious across the province, especially in the north, which hasn't seen much rain. All told, some 24,000 Albertans are still out of their homes tonight. 
So here's where approximately 80 active wildfires are burning. About two dozen of them are out of control. That is slightly fewer than yesterday, but that could all change when the heat returns. Until that happens, firefighters are using the cooler weather to breathe a bit and to strategize. Here's Aaron Collins on plans being laid for a counteroffensive. From the air, the scope of this crisis, undeniable. This wildfire, just one of dozens burning across Alberta. But it's on the ground where plans to contain it are mapped out. Walk me through what this map is showing you. Okay, so this map is showing the, the, the initial ignition point was back over here to the east of Fox Creek, and it has grown 52 kilometers from tip to tip, and it's currently sitting at 22,000 hectares in size, and it is out of control. Fox Creek is on the front lines in Alberta's wildfire fight. It's fire chief, one of the field generals. We have a two-day window to, to, to set up defenses and, uh, and make sure we can reinforce that. Cooler weather allows crews here to fight this wildfire with fire, burning a line around the town to starve an approaching fire of fuel. Tens of thousands of Albertans still out of their homes, tensions rising among some evacuees at this town hall. I have farm animals that I cannot crate up and take to a hotel. They're farm animals, farm dogs, farm cats, chickens. How do you load 50 chickens into a hotel? I just want to make sure they have water and food. Several First Nations communities have also been evacuated and are reporting substantial damage. The chief of the Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation says dozens of buildings there have burnt. This is going to take uh, several weeks to sort out. We're asking our residents to be, to be patient with us as we work um, on a recovery plan. A cruise across Alberta working to slow an already unprecedented wildfire season. We've already had 390,000 hectares burned, so it's already 10 times the, the typical fire year, and we're really just getting started. Back in Fox Creek, people are still being told to stay away. This normally bustling community, now a ghost town. And for now, at least, it needs to stay that way. I'm a volunteer also, and I want to go home, and I want to go back to the way life was, but um, I can't sleep well at night knowing that what's lurking out there is, could turn on us. So, Aaron, what's the province saying to the evacuees who just really want to go home? Yeah, Adrian, they're saying be patient. Like pretty much everybody in this province, officials are watching the weather, waiting to determine if they should be sending people back to their homes or asking other people to evacuate theirs. And here in High Prairie, folks have been told that they need to be ready to hit the road at any time. All right, Aaron Collins in High Prairie. Now to give you a clearer sense of why so many are worried about the weather. According to Natural Resources Canada, this is a look at Alberta's fire risk levels tonight after that rain. Much of it low or moderate, but look at the projected risk for Monday. Red or extreme over most of the province. CBC News meteorologist Christy Kleimenhaga is in Edmonton tonight. So Christy, it seems like the next few days are actually going to be pretty dangerous. Yeah, I mean, we've had this break early this week, which has really helped out in parts of central Alberta, not so much in northern Alberta. But as we move into the weekend, that's when things are going to change. Again, we're seeing another wave of heat building as you especially make your way to the end of the weekend and start of next week. It's, it's one of those heat dome setups that we like to hear about. Those upper atmosphere trends where you are seeing that heat building day after day, a dry period, and then starting to see some relief after a number of days. Everything just blocks. Up. So that's what we've got going this weekend. Of course, when you get into these setups, those dry conditions, those hot conditions, it doesn't take very long for that fire risk to go from more moderate, which we are seeing early this week, to much more severe and extreme, which is what we saw last weekend. And again, looking like what we're going to see this weekend. Christy, does any of this give us a sense of what the fire season head's going to look like? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, when we look at our seasonal forecast, it looks like we are going to see above normal temperatures for much of the summer. At least that's what we're calling for for much of Alberta. But then as you make your way through the summer, it all depends on when the rain comes. If it comes every five days or so, we might be OK. So a busy start, but hard to say for the rest of the summer at this point. All right, Christy Klemenhaga, thank you. You're welcome.
China is making good on a threat of retaliation tonight. It expelled the Canadian diplomat just hours after Ottawa did the same to a Chinese diplomat accused of targeting a Conservative MP. As Rafi Bujikanian tells us, there is concern about what could happen next. China warned its retaliation would be swift, and it wasn't kidding. We are asking a Canadian diplomat in Shanghai, Jennifer Lin Lalonde, to leave, he said. This is China's move to safeguard its legitimate rights and interests. It came just hours after Ottawa expelled Chinese diplomat Zhao Wei over allegations he tried to intimidate a Conservative MP. The Prime Minister remained defiant Tuesday. We will not be intimidated and we will continue to do everything necessary to keep uh, our uh, our. Canadians, uh, keep Canadians protected from foreign interference. The tit-for-tat comes a week after the Globe and Mail first reported that a 2021 CSIS report showed Beijing sought information about a member of parliament who had family living in China. An unnamed security source reportedly told the Globe the MP was conservative Michael Chong and the person looking for intel was Chinese diplomat Zhao Wei. China sanctioned Chong in 2021 after he condemned the country's treaty of its minority Uyghur population. The Conservatives saying the government was too slow to act on kicking Zhao out. They finally expelled the guy who did it, and that is the very least they could have done. We will continue to ensure that we're standing up for our values, taking seriously uh, these issues, which is uh, why we uh, did take the time uh, to ensure that as we uh, declared a Chinese diplomat persona non grata, uh, it was done appropriately. If we expel one of their people, they will expel someone comparable uh, in China. You know, nothing unexpected or unusual about that. Still, this former diplomat says Beijing could go further. I think what we have to look at is if China will go beyond that and engage in some kind of um, spurious trade sanctions, violation of trade contracts to try and punish uh, Canada. So, Rafi, I gather you're hearing that the Canadian government could very well be expecting these kinds of further reactions from China. Adrian, a senior government source says that's in part why the decision to expel Zhao Wei took this long. That Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie spoke to cabinet ministers whose roles touch on trade and security portfolios and told them to brace themselves for potential consequences. Now, the hope among government officials is trade sanctions won't happen, but nobody quite knows for sure. All right. Rafi Bujikani in Ottawa, thank you. The Prime Minister now says his government will not implement a policy critics warn could hurt press freedom. Yeah, we will never uh, harm journalists' capacity to do the professional, independent work that they do. At its convention on Saturday, the Liberal Party passed a resolution it says was designed to fight misinformation. It in part aimed to hold online services accountable for the veracity of information on the platforms and to only publish material with traceable sources. Critics are worried the policy could censor journalists and interfere with the use of anonymous sources. A move tonight by the Quebec government is aimed at cracking down on illegal short-term rentals, and it could come at a big cost for sites like Airbnb. As Alison Northcott tells us, the proposed changes come after a tragedy earlier this year. This fire in old Montreal that killed seven people, most of them renting illegal Airbnbs, put a sharpened focus on short-term rental platforms. Now, the Quebec government wants to tighten the rules and seek more accountability directly from platforms like Airbnb. When we called them in a meeting earlier this month, uh, I think I made it extremely clear, extremely clear that um, it's game on and here are the new rules. If the bill passes, sites would have to verify each host has a valid, up-to-date certificate issued by the province. Listings without must be taken down or the platform could be fined up to $100,000. Per false ad. So if they put online five ads that are false, it's five times $100,000. It was already mandatory for hosts to register with the province. After the fire, Airbnb removed listings without registration numbers, but beyond that, critics say there's been little enforcement. You know, we have a good system in place here, but Airbnb ignored it. 
but we shouldn't rely on Airbnb deciding that there's a PR crisis every so often to uphold their end of the bargain. They should be proactively removing listings that don't have current numbers. That's what Quebec's proposed law aims to ensure. We bought a house, a triplex, and we wanted to have an extra source of revenue to be able to pay our mortgage as fast as possible. Steve Fabre has two legal Airbnb units. He got a registration number after he was fined for running them without one. He agrees the platform should have to pay for breaking the rules too. Considering that obviously Airbnb is making way more money than the users, the fact is they should have some kind of responsibility. The province hopes its bill will lead to more compliance. A spokesperson for Airbnb says the company is reviewing the changes. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Ukraine is getting another billion dollars in military aid from the U.S. Those are Ukrainian troops firing at Russian locations north of Donetsk today. The Pentagon announced more munitions will be heading their way shortly. The new package includes drones, artillery rounds and air defense equipment. That announcement came just hours after Russian missiles pummeled Ukraine. And as Margaret Evans tells us, that was just before Russia marked a scaled-down holiday in Moscow. The ramrod precision of thousands of soldiers marching in step was on display, as ever, at Russia's annual Victory Day parade in Red Square, commemorating the defeat of Nazi Germany. The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, was also in familiar form, criticizing others for the war he started against Ukraine. Civilization is once again at a crucial turning point, he said. A real war has been unleashed against our homeland. The shadow of Russia's invasion of Ukraine 14 months ago was impossible to ignore. An 83-year-old tank, a relic of Russia's fight against the Nazis, was the only one on parade. Russia's modern tanks, presumably busy fighting Putin's war, were destroyed by it. And there were 3,000 fewer soldiers on the parade ground this year compared to last. The parade began just hours after Russia launched another wave of missile attacks against Ukraine, over a dozen aimed at the capital, Kyiv. The European Commission president, Ursula von der Leyen, arrived shortly afterwards, a symbolic visit coming as it does on Europe Day, when European Union nations celebrate peace and unity. Kyiv, as the capital of Ukraine, is the beating heart of today's European values. Ukraine is on the front line of the defense of everything we European cherish. The recent uptick in attacks on Ukraine comes as its soldiers continue to prepare for a counteroffensive against Russia. For many Victory Day parades outside of Moscow weren't just scaled back, but canceled altogether. Mark Redevin, CBC News, London. Israel's prime minister says he is sending a message tonight to what he calls his country's enemies. Don't mess with us, he says. Benjamin Netanyahu spoke to the nation hours after Israel's military carried out airstrikes in Gaza. Palestinian officials say three Islamic militants were killed, as well as 12 other civilians, including children. Some violent protests across Pakistan after that country's former prime minister was arrested on corruption charges. Salima Shibji shows us the dramatic moments when it all went down. The vehicle carrying Imran Khan inched slowly towards the Islamabad courthouse, bulletproof shields aloft. But Pakistan's paramilitary forces moved quickly storming the area in full riot gear. Arresting the former prime minister on corruption charges he denies and dragging Khan to their armored vehicles. It came shortly after he had entered the court compound to face separate corruption charges, which Khan has said are politically motivated. One of Khan's lawyers injured in the ensuing chaos as police broke courthouse windows. And Khan's supporters called the arrest an abduction orchestrated by the army. Imran Khan 
This arrest is the point of no return, an official with Khan's Pakistan, Tariqe and Saf party said. He called for the politician supporters to take to the streets. And they did. Protests erupting across the country in Peshawar, Lahore, Karachi. Clashes between Khan's supporters and police devolved into a haze of fire, tear gas and water cannons, with the internet cut off in some areas. The crisis has been escalating for months, ever since the former prime minister was ousted from power in a no-confidence vote last year, with Khan openly accusing the Pakistani army and the current government of conspiring against him and of trying to kill him. Allegations he repeated hours before his arrest. An arrest that threatens to plunge Pakistan further into political turmoil. With widespread unrest, a very real fear ahead of the elections slated for this fall. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Bangkok. New advice out of the U.S. lowers the suggested age for routine breast cancer screening. What's on the line is people's quality of life. We look at what's behind the change in messaging and how Canada stacks up. And a personal look at a life-changing treatment for people with Parkinson's. So if I didn't have deep brain stimulation, I would have to take drugs to control this. How it works and the staggering results it can achieve. Plus, Snoop Dogg and Ryan Reynolds may have some competition. Why the race to own the Ottawa Senators might be heating up. We're back in two. Hudson's Bay is laying off another 250 workers tonight, so that doubles the number of job cuts so far this year. The company blames economic pressures in the retail industry, says the layoffs are impacting corporate roles, not retail workers. There is a significant change in advice out of the United States tonight about when to start routine breast cancer screenings. A medical task force is recommending lowering the age from 50 to 40. If Musa looks at why and what the advice is here in Canada. Come, doggies, you are so good. Natalie Quadron says it was 2019 when she first felt a lump in her breast while taking a shower. I was 46 at the time, so I wasn't particularly worried. Neither was her doctor, she says, at first. We do recommend mammograms from 50 onwards. You're only 46, so chances of you having breast cancer aren't very big. Today, Natalie says she's living with terminal cancer, something she wishes was caught sooner. I am a little angry. It's a, it's a bitter pill to swallow that I was too young to get a mammogram. A panel of independent medical experts from across Canada recommend mammograms every two to three years for individuals between the ages of 50 and 74. Provinces like Ontario and Quebec follow that advice. In Alberta, where Natalie lives, the recommended age for breast cancer screenings was lowered last year to 45. But Natalie says... It's not standardized across Canada. And some experts want it to be. All women who are at average risk should be screened at 40, but especially uh, black, Asian and Hispanic women whose breast cancers tend to start younger than in white women. So their peak incidence is in the mid 40s. That's one of the reasons why a U.S. panel of medical experts has revised its advice on routine mammograms in that country. It now recommends those at average risk start getting regular mammograms at 40. I do feel that Canada should take notice. What's on the line is that people's, uh, people's quality of life and people's lives are at risk. Breathe. Canada's panel of experts say those who are younger than 50 who wish to be screened should have a discussion with their health care provider to decide if it's best for them. They also say that decision should be weighed against the potential harms, such as false positives and overdiagnosis. Idil Moussa, CBC News, Toronto. There's an exciting tool giving new hope to people with Parkinson's. It involves a clinical procedure whereby two probes are inserted into the brain. A first-hand look at the treatment and the life-changing impact of deep brain stimulation. And highlighting the rise and the fall of a Canadian juggernaut. 
they had the world in the palm of their hands and then they fumbled it and it was gone. We'll talk to the stars of Blackberry the movie. The National takes you deeper into the stories shaping our world. Next. The story of me, take two. Michael J. Fox is going back to his past. The Canadian actor has a new documentary out this week. In it, he talks about how his life changed when he was 29 years old and diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So one treatment for Parkinson's is something called deep brain stimulation. It's a procedure our colleague Harry Forrestell underwent. Tonight, he is sharing his personal experience with us, demonstrating how it works, why it may not be for everyone, and how it's made all the difference in his life. The human brain is an incredibly complex organ. There are changes taking place in here that we know nothing about, often until it's too late. Take me, for example. I have Parkinson's disease, a chronic, although not fatal, condition that undermines the brain's ability to control the body's limbs and muscle groups. Since I was diagnosed in 2015, I've really struggled to deal with this insidious invader. And everything from walking and talking to running to eating, even breathing, is becoming more and more difficult. But there are ways to deal with Parkinson's disease. And one of them I found has made a huge difference in my life. It's called deep brain stimulation, or DBS. And it helps me with the condition that does this. Sorry. <laughs> now there are many emerging therapies to treat Parkinson's and DBS isn't the solution that will work for everyone. But it is one that has changed my life. The thing about deep brain stimulation is that scientists still aren't exactly sure how it works or even why, only that it does. But here's what we do know. You've probably heard of dopamine. It does a lot of things in the body. Our brain produces it to help get messages from the brain's command center to the body's muscles and outlying limbs. But in brains like mine, dopamine-producing cells begin dying off early in life. Without a reliable supply of dopamine, commands from the brain can get scrambled or mistimed. That's why people with Parkinson's sometimes shake or tremor uncontrollably, or at other times they can't move at all. Fortunately, there is a drug that treats the effects of Parkinson's. It's called levodopa, and it does a remarkable job of fending off the effects of the disease. Remarkable, but not perfect. The problem is that levodopa is not a perfect drug. It's a very short-acting drug, and with that, the patient may fluctuate from being very good and mobile to actually uh, declining in function. So we talk about on when the patient is responding, and off when the patient, uh, when they, the drugs lo are, lose their benefit and the patient is, is no longer mobile. And this can occur many times a day. Here's how DBS helps manage some of those symptoms. It involves a clinical procedure whereby two probes are inserted into the brain. They are then attached by wires to an impulse generator under the skin of the chest. The impulse generator emits electrical signals down through the probes and into the brain, and that helps override some of the mechanical effects of Parkinson's. Somehow, and we don't know why or even how yet, those charges can override the tremors and reduce them dramatically. So early one September morning, I found myself in hospital having a box bolted to my head. Not a box really, it was more like a framework, but it's meant to keep the cranium steady while doctors operate. It's an important consideration when you're having your brain skewered and you don't want to damage the useful bits. With the frame in place, I was wheeled into the surgical suite. It was a busy, busy place. People rushing around, plastic sheets being hung to create a sterile environment. All of that noise and activity was almost drowned out in my own head, at least, by the sound of the drill cutting through the skull. It was loud, but I'm thin-skulled and it didn't actually last that long. It's a strange feeling having someone mess about in your brain while you're still awake. There's no pain as the brain has no pain sensors. So as the surgeons slide those probes into place, it's important to pay attention to telltale signs like a tingle in your hand or your foot or the fizz of warmth up one leg. 
That lets you know that the surgeons are getting those probes in exactly the right place. So once the probes are in place, I was put to sleep with an anesthetic. That was so surgeons could wire up the probes to an impulse generator placed under the skin of my chest. I was then sent home to heal, and after several weeks, I returned to have it all turned on. And the result was truly staggering. Here's a video we made that shows the difference of having the device turned on versus when it's turned off. When you get deep brain stimulation, they give you these two things, basic cell phone with the program on it, and this is a data collector. And if I want to turn off my therapy to illustrate what I would look like with full-blown Parkinson's and no relief from it, I would turn my therapy off. And this is going to prompt me to use this to be sure I'm doing what I want done. So place communicator and continue. I'll do that. So this is downloading information from a pack in my chest that is very much like a pacemaker very small, and uh, in some cases it has a rechargeable battery. Now I can feel my DBS, my deep brain stimulation therapy going off, and the reaction is almost immediate in that, in that I begin to shake and, sorry. <laughs> um, and that's what it's like with the therapy off. So if I didn't have deep brain stimulation, I would have to take drugs to control this. I've been able to minimize my drug intake because of deep brain stimulation, which is good because most of the drugs have some side effects. But as you can see, if I wasn't taking medication and not taking deep brain stimulation, I would have a very hard time even taking a drink of water. And for people who have Parkinson's, it's not really a pleasant way to live. However, we do have deep brain stimulation. In my case, it works pretty well. I'm gonna turn it back on and it's communicating with this device that will now tell the pack to start. And I can feel a tingle in my heel that creeps up my leg as the stimulation starts to take place. So those electrical impulses now are back. They're firing again in my brain as they do night and day and overriding that impulse I have to shake or tremor and as you can see, the results are almost instantaneous. Turns out I'm one of the lucky few. There are only about 400 of these procedures performed in Canada every year, due in large part to the limited number of surgeons available to perform it. The good news is that DBS is becoming more common. The bad news, it doesn't work for everybody with Parkinson's. People who have underlying conditions or who don't respond well to levodopa or who are simply too old, will have to look elsewhere for relief. We're still here at CBC Television. How are you? Great. For me, regaining motor control of my body has been nothing short of a miracle. Mm -hmm. I've managed to cut my medication intake almost in half. My doctors tell me DBS could provide me another 10 to 15 years of relative tremor-free living. I would have been happy with just five. Wonderful, thank you very much, Monsieur Caron. Good to speak with you. I haven't beaten Parkinson's, not by a long shot, but Parkinson's hasn't beaten me either, and that's a standoff I can live with. It's now been eight months since Harry's procedure. He says he's doing well, which we're all so glad to hear. Thank you for doing that piece, Harry. So he originally told his story as part of a new show on our new streaming service. You can watch This Week in Canada on CBC News Explore, as well as the CBC News app and on CBC Jam. Now, BlackBerry is back, but only on the big screen. Hmm. Try typing with your thumbs. Eli Glasner gives us an inside look at the movie, the motivation, and how it was made. I was this cool high-tech guy when I got there, right? Yeah. And I was the first president to have a Blackberry. And so, <laughs> years pass, and no one else has Blackberry. <laughs> and, you know, I still got the clip. On he the, is on the perhaps oh, the world's most famous yeah. Blackberry fanatic, but not the only one. Recognize this guy. He is still struggling one year after Blackberry stopped working because their software was decommissioned. The rise and fall 
of BlackBerry may be a cautionary tale to some, but to actor and filmmaker Jay Baruchel, it's a historic Canadian story of innovation, and it's also the subject of his new movie. He told Eli Glasner why it's all so close to his heart. We made a thing, and we're proud of the thing, and people seem to want to see the thing, and people that have seen it like it, so it's just, it's all love right now. Actor Jay Baruchel is buzzing to bring the story of the Canadian smartphone that changed the world to the big screen. What do you call it? It's called a Blackberry. Hmm. Huh. Try typing with your thumbs. After wowing audiences at the Berlin Film Festival and South by Southwest in Austin, Blackberry the movie has come home. So uh, my mom's here, my stepfather is here, uh, both sets of my in-laws are here, like everybody's here, it's lovely. It's a big swing for Baruchel who plays co-founder Mike Lazaridis. Blackberry director Matt Johnson plays Mike's best friend and fellow co-founder Doug Freegan. There is a free wireless internet signal all across North America and nobody has figured out how to use it. It's like the force. Sorry, have you seen Star Wars? Johnson says the role forced the comedic actor out of his comfort zone. So, uh... Um, we've been talking. He's a very physical, gesticular actor, and in minimizing all that stuff, it reads on screen to me as perfectionism, a, a, a guy who wants to say something but doesn't. But the insular inventor is only half of the story. Sure, yes, Doug, what, come with us, sir. No, you want to be great, you need to sacrifice. And the more painful the sacrifice, the greater you'll be. I need a prototype. Blackberry could have stayed a small startup if not for the deal maker Jim Balsilli, played by its always sunny in Philadelphia star, Glenn Howerton, who says for Balsilli, Blackberry was a means to an end. He's not a tech guy, so it doesn't strike me as, that I don't know why he would have any reason to be passionate about the product itself as much as recognizing that it was filling a void in the market that he could exploit. What they do so well is capture the insane story of this little company in Waterloo. Jackie McNish, who co-wrote the book that inspired the film, says the movie is quite different from their reporting. I was watching it and the, my brain was just going, this is really funny, this is really funny. Our book was not funny. To bring research in motion back to life, the film transformed an office space in Hamilton to the RIM engineering department. What's it like? I mean, I'm With Baruchel in full Mike Lazaridis mode, we traveled back to the mid-2000s. Here, here's a milestone I've hit, is that like I'm one of the oldest people on set. And uh, you know, like my mother couldn't believe that the director That gray isn't real me. just yet, Jay. Th this isn't, but you know, I'm, I'm 40 and like, you know, there's a sort of novelty aspect to, for a lot of people, yeah. not for me. I, re I remember when absolutely everything here had a practical use. Behind the painstakingly assembled vintage computer monitors and microchips, there's a reason this story resonates with the actor who has stayed living and working in Canada. For all of their faults and for whatever they got wrong, um, Mike and Jim were and are both patriots. They, they, you know, J Jim had a fixation with beating the Americans at their own game, and, uh, and, and, and the fact is they both still live in Waterloo. But Blackberry also ushered in the always-on, always-connected world we live in. It's also the start of our addiction, I think, you know, because the idea that you ever needed something, a phone to do more than just call people, is like a, you know, crazy thing. A bad morning on the markets for RIM. While today Blackberry is seen as a failure, there's also something quintessentially Canadian. There's something almost embarrassing about it, about how they had the world in the palm of their hands and then they fumbled it and it was gone. And there's something about the, maybe it's the humility of the Canadian character that it, it just seemed to fit right into the archetype of what it meant to be a Canadian success story. You said they were the best engineers in the world. I said they're the best engineers in Canada. Now with a big screen debut and CBC series coming this fall, the phone is getting the close-up it deserves. What did you want us, like the audience, to know about BlackBerry? How profoundly important 
the uh, innovation that these nerds above a diner in Waterloo in 1996 uh, came up with. Just how profoundly important that is to the world as we know it. The way that we participate in the world, the way that we relate to one another, all of it stands on the shoulders of what they created. It's really interesting to see him like this. I think most people know him as a comedic actor, but clearly the story hit for him on a number of the right levels. Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, I think he loves the idea of challenging the way we see him and really sinking his teeth into a somewhat more dramatic role. And he is a proud Canadian. He is a part owner of a comic book company that publishes Captain Canuck. <laughs> so that is very Canadian. But let me leave you with one little tidbit. Matt Johnson, the director, when he called Jay Baruchel to pitch this project, Baruchel answered on his Blackberry. He huh. loved that phone. He was one of the last diehards. He didn't give it up until 2021. So he was That's certainly, impressive. yeah, the right man to uh, bring this back. Ah, oh, thank you, Eli. My pleasure. Another celebrity appears to be interested in owning the Ottawa Senators. Why the franchise is generating so much buzz from high profile bidders, plus. <laughs> 81 t-shirts and 42 pounds before the sweat. So crazy. Plenty of layers to this next one. A BC man runs a marathon wearing 81 t-shirts. Why? In our moment. Former CBC journalist Connie Walker has received a Pulitzer Prize for audio recording. She won for her podcast, Stolen, Surviving St. Michael's that investigates her father's abuse at a residential school. She describes the award as an incredible honor and not just for her. What it says about the story that our team told uh, about my dad and my family, but also about all of the survivors. Walker now works for the New York-based podcast company Gimlet Media. She's a member of the Okanese First Nation in Saskatchewan. And the weekend may not be known by that moniker for much longer. In an interview with W Magazine, Abel Tesfaye said he's ready to close his, quote, weekend chapter and shed the alter ego. It also looks like he may be throwing his name into a much different ring, reportedly joining the list of celebrities hoping to buy the Ottawa Senators. Nicole Williams looks at why so many stars are so interested. You could say people in Ottawa are blinded by the spotlight on their hockey team. Canadian singer The Weeknd is reportedly the latest celebrity to be part of a bid to buy the Sens. If so, he's got some serious competition. Snoop Dogg is no stranger to the city. Last week, he confirmed he also wants to own the team. I've been, you know, down with the NHL for a long time, going to games announcing games. In interviews, the rapper called Ottawa a thriving city and promised the Sens would perform better under his ownership. Oh, no. Then there's Ryan Reynolds. The Canadian actor was the first major celebrity to express interest. I love Ottawa. I grew up, I grew up uh, in Vancouver, which has my heart always, but, but I also grew up in Ottawa, uh, Canada. So I spent uh, a long time in Vanier there, which is a little town right inside Ottawa. It's a level of attention an NHL team hasn't quite seen before, but something its commissioner says is long overdue. It should tell all the fans in Ottawa that this franchise is going to have a very bright future right there in Ottawa. But the appeal of buying the Sens is about more than the city or the team, says this expert. It's a big business opportunity. They're not actually interested in the Ottawa Senators. They're interested in owning a professional sports franchise. Whichever group you get involved in, the amazing thing is they show a huge appreciation and value in very short amount of time. Ottawa's mayor says whoever has the winning bid, the city comes out a winner. They want to do exciting things here. They've checked out the city. They've checked out the market. They've... They've looked at the potential in Ottawa and they see opportunity here. There are still a few days left if any other celebrities are looking to submit bids. The owners are expected to be announced later this month. Nicole Williams, CBC News, Ottawa. All right, from running a hockey team to running a marathon, you're looking at Alex Reed from BC who ran the Vancouver Marathon this weekend, get this, while wearing 81 t-shirts. Dressed up like the Michelin man, he was attempting to set a Guinness World Record when he waddled his way to the finish line. The distinctly unusual accomplishment is our moment. 
So this past weekend, I ran the BMO Vancouver Marathon. I decided to try and set a Guinness World Record by wearing 81 t-shirts during the marathon. What number are we at, Peter? This is uh, 71. And uh, I successfully got across the finish line. So how are you feeling right now? I'm a little tired, a little warm. So I've always wanted to set a Guinness World Record. It's been a life goal of mine. I've tried a couple of times. So you put 81 shirts on, I would guess it took about half an hour. 81 t-shirts is hot with a lot of people in the car park coming up going what on earth are you doing this is just my way to have fun put a smile on people's faces make people chuckle certainly did that waddling around the streets of vancouver wearing 81 shirts on sunday you know what it's all worth it then my legs are telling me it's the stupidest thing i've ever done in the world but that's a different thing <laughs> when i crossed the finish line it was i finished i've done it but now i've got to get all these shirts off 81 Small detail, he didn't actually break the record because it took him roughly six hours to finish it, just a little bit too long. As always next year. That is a national for May the 9th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.